So, uh, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Co-Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, I would like first just to thank the organized committee for inviting me to participate to this uh, uh, session and uh, about post-operative -oper uh, care. And I would like to uh, present uh, in summary a paper we present, uh, we published uh, four years ago about critical review of post-operative care in sinus surgery. So this uh, study was published in the current opinion in otolaryngology and atonic surgery, and I would like to uh, name my co-author, Andrew, Andrew Speecher from UK and Anne-Lise Poirier from Belgium. So the first thing we can say is that most of the authors, when they talk about postoperative care, said that postoperative care after endonasal sinus surgery is integral part of the surgery. Why should we do postoperative care? The aim is probably to optimize the uh, wood healing. How? To maintain the operative cavity open and clean, to reduce local inflammation and infection, to prevent lateralization of the middle turbinate, to prevent development of adhesions, to prevent complication in the early postoperative phase, to promote early return of serial function and, of course, to improve short-term patient symptoms. However, there is no standardized approach to postoperative care. Current practices vary widely among ENT surgeons because there is no general consensus on how, what, when to do it. There are a lot of discrepancies between uh, experts' opinion and the result of RCT uh, study, and even if some study questioned the value of postoperative care, it is considered as sufficiently secure that the instrumental postoperative care improve the surgical outcomes on the long term. What about the postoperative care? What can we do? What must we do? There are different modalities, nasal saline rinsing, in-office sinus cavity debridement, topical nasal steroids or short course of systemic steroids, and maybe the use of systemic antibiotics. Let's start with the nasal saline irrigation, nasal douches or nasal rinsing, and we must claim that intensive Nasal douching is unanimously recommended for patients undergoing sinus surgery. Humidification of the postoperative cavities contributes to reduce crusting and has positive effects on the mucosal repitalization. And there are six randomized controlled studies that support the use of saline irrigation. However, there are differences between vapor or drops or what we call a low volume system and rinsing. The recommended dose is 200 ml per rinsing. Up to now, inhalation and nebulizer are less effective for the postoperative care after sinus surgery. So usually it is recommended by most of the order to use high volume douches. That means uh, 250 milliliters of isotonic or hypertonic solution with a compressible nasal douching device that's a low pressure. They are started from the first postoperative day or immediately after removal of the nasal packing. And this is important, it is recommended to rinse three to six times a day at the beginning, and then with time you can decrease to three times a day or two times a day. As an alternative or complementary method, Osman, which is a pupil of Vigant, proposed in Germany the temporary occlusion of the nose with a simple tape. This can uh, optimize the wood healing, 
it accelerated the epitalization, it reduced crusting, there is less pain, and early rinsing are still possible. So first, nasal rinsing, everybody agrees about this. The second is the in-office sinus cavity debridement. The evidence for or, or cons in-office nasal debridement is not clear because there is no general consensus and subsequently the follow-up protocol for first patient is still down to the surgeon's preference. However, it seems to be favorable and can improve the postoperative uh, outcomes. What can we do? What have to do? We have to remove all blood, crust, secretion, fibrin clutch, coagulation, beginning sinecure in the cru uh, crucial area of the paranasal sinus, and sometimes we can remove some edematous mucosa. When and how often can we do this debridement? Many sinus surgeons start it eight days after the surgery and repeat it every two weeks. At the beginning, Stammerger Kennedy promote to do it twice a day for the first, post for the first week postoperatively, but it seems that there is no sense. The timing and number of the consultation depend on the severity of the crusting, present of granulation, position of the middle turbinate, so whether there is infection or not, and the severity of the inflammatory reaction. But we must also take into account the underlying disease, the patient discomfort, the pain, the time required for the debridement, the risk of infection by Staphylococcus aureus, and the cost for the patient for additional appointment. So nasal winching, sinus debridement, and what about antibiotics? There is no evidence to give antibiotics after current sinus surgery when there is no signs of active intraoperative infection of postoperative complication. Postoperative care with amoxicillin clavulanate has no impact on the outcomes in prospective control trial. Macrolides are not necessary systematically after surgery Antibiotics maybe have uh, some side effects. Local antibiotics by spray are not recommended. And regarding nasal rinsing with antibiotics, they are not currently re recommended. However, you have to give antibiotics in case of acute complication, etmoiditis, phenoiditis. In case of surgery associated with an acute exacerbation of COS, in case of odontogenic cause of uh, sinusitis, and of course, when you have a nasal packing for more than 24 hours. What about the corticosteroids, the systemic corticosteroids? We have heard that can be very helpful to reduce inflammation and to make the operating time shorter. So corticosteroids are commonly used by sinus surgeons in the perioperative period. And Pundin published in 2016 a systemic review and meta-analysis proving that preoperative -pre use of systemic steroids result in significantly reduced blood loss, shorten operative time, and improve surgical field quality. But this is not as clear as for chronic rhinosinusitis without polyps. In case of acute exacerbation, prescription of local or system steroids is not recommended. On the other hand, when you have a chronic sinusitis with nasal polyps, yes, pre- and intraoperative corticosteroid administration can be helpful just to reduce the size of the polyps the edema, the polypoid uh, mucosa, and the scarring. And what about the intranasal corticosteroids after FES? Topical nasal steroids promote wood healing after endoscopic uh, sinus surgery and decrease the local uh, inflammation. It seems to be reasonable 
just to start topical steroid application after the first instrumental cleaning, after one week. Otherwise, you can't, the topical steroid can't reach the middle matrix or the etmoid cavity. Immediately after surgery can also be useful. This crusting can be avoided by occlusion or intensive nasal rinsing. The application of topical steroids is performed by means of nasal rinsing, which works much better in the early postoperative phase than drops or spray. There are some analyses and publication from US and from Belgium, from Singdom and up, promoting the use of intranasal corticosteroids after FES. It shows that there is a significant improvement in nasal in polyp score, patient symptoms, and significant decrease in polyp recurrence in the first postoperative period. So in conclusion, despite a lack of consensus, Postoperative care remains an important part in the management of patients undergoing fast for CRS refractory to maximal medical treatment. Current practice includes nasal douches with compressible device with a high volume of saline. In office nasal debridement has many advantages and may be and must be performed and the endoscopic control by the surgeon himself. But the patient discomfort can be a limiting factor. Corticosteroids can play a role in the pre- and intraoperative period, especially in chronic rhinosinusitis with nasal polyps. It's not as clear as for chronic rhinosinusitis without antibiotics is no longer indicate except in case of odontogenic sinusitis or acute exacerbation of sinusitis. And finally, but we have to discuss, stents may be a method to prevent formation of idesion. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Eloy. Um, I've just checked with the um, uh, uh, crew at the back there. Unfortunately, um, uh, Dr. Han isn't, um, or has not provided a presentation virtually. Uh, I would invite him, if he's now in the audience, to step forward. Uh, he doesn't appear to be. So in that case, um, what we'll do is we'll um, open the floor to questions. Uh, we've had three very stimulating and interesting uh, presentations. Are there any questions for our presenters? Yes, sir. So thank you for your question. So um, I think that when you compare nasal spray in Belgium, we have Sterimar and Physiomer. Usually the patient just use a very, very small amount of water and saline. And so this amount of saline doesn't reach the sinus cavity. So we have what we call rhino or rinicure. That's a device where you put just warm water, not too hot, and you can press delicately the, this. And I think that there is no risk of bleeding if you do use this because it's like, well, you put water well, slowly in the, in the nose. If you use a spray, they try to use it six times uh, for, for, for once, and then you can touch the, the septum, you can uh, irritate. So with this kind of method just to, uh, to deliver the water, there is no risk of bleeding. And we know that warm water is preventing for the bleeding as, as well. Thank you. Any further questions for Professor Eloy? I also have a question to Professor Louis. Uh, 
uh, what is your opinion about uh, ornaments? Uh, for example, in Russia, it's very popular to put ornaments in the nose uh, after surgery in post-operative period. Well, do we, think about this? We, we do not use ornament in, in, in Belgium. We use nasal cream, okay? So nasal ornaments, were a regular one. Mm. I don't think that it's necessary to put in the cream some medication because maybe it, it doesn't help. Maybe only could help to present infection to promote uh, revitalization. But usually we use a rinsing and a nasal ornament three or four times a day. The, 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 the concept of this is to keep the sinus cavity uh, wet, humid. That's very important in the first or the early postoperative period. Thank you. Can I ask you a question, Professor? Um, it, it, it's interesting, as you allude to, the evidence is not really very clear. Um, it's, it's not that there isn't any evidence or there is evidence, it's just the evidence hasn't been developed, I suppose. Um, but um, a number of years ago, there was a, a, a big interest in uh, types of medication that would reduce surface tension. Um, so the addition of manuka honey or baby shampoo, a few drops to the sinus rinses, where, where do you think we are with that now? Well, I think that for current postoperative care, when you have a common sinus surgery for CRS with or without polyps, without infection and so on, and in the majority of the case, it goes well. So there is no necessity just to put other things, okay? Saline, topical steroids, okay, that's the key. But for this patient who are not so, so good, so good healing, then you have to put something. Shampoo, uh, for example, baby shampoo, you can give it if you have something of infection, Staphylococcus aureus, opiocyanic, and so on. And you know that if you give antibiotics, you modify the flora of the sinus just for at least one month. So if you can reduce the systemic antibiotics, that's better. So baby shampoo, why not? Maybe only, why not? Maybe a phytotherapy, why not? But we have to prove that this can help, but I think I'm very convinced that in the majority of the case, for at least two-thirds of our patients, it's not necessary. Thank you. I have a question. Yeah. Uh, do you use local antibiotics or just systemic post-operative? So we give antibiotics just during the, the anesthesia, one dose, then sometimes when you put some resorbable packing we give antibiotic for five days, no long, but no local antibiotics after the surgery. Is Dr. Spring still here?